again, since we're in chapter two, we don't really have any calculations, so we're going through all these concept questions. So 10A, which one's correct? The most important difference between spot markets versus future markets is the maturity of the instruments that are traded. That is just, that's not true. I don't know if that's, I guess that's in the book, but it's really kind of a more advanced type of a question. Um, spot markets are where you can buy things on the spot, like you can buy cattle, or it usually has to do with commodities, like gold, corn, soybeans, things like that. And futures markets are where you make a contract to lock in a price for a future date. So th this whole thing is just a weird thing I would have never thought of to say. Um, so it's just, it's not true. Don't, yeah, it's better if you don't read it so it won't confuse you. And then 10, B, capital market transactions involve only preferred stock or common stock. It's not only those two, also bonds. Just remember, bonds are included there. And then C, if General Electric were to issue new stock this year, this would be considered a secondary market transaction. Okay, anytime a company issues new stock, that's a primary market transaction. And then D, both NASDAQ dealers and specialists on the New York Stock Exchange hold inventories of stocks. Well, that is true. They both do. And then E, money market transactions do not involve securities denominated in currencies other than the US, US dollar. And that one is false. They can be denominated in another currency. And then question 11 is true or false. The over-the-counter market received its name years ago because brokerage firms would hold inventories of stocks and then sell them by literally passing them over the counter to the buyer. So as for a history lesson, that is true. And it makes sense. Like one thing that really makes sense. And then question 12, another which statement is correct. So A, the term IPO stands for introductory price offered. And that's just not true. It stands for an initial public offering. And then B, IPO prices are generally established by the market and buyers of the new stock must pay the price that prevails at the close of trading on the day the stock is offered to the public. It is not established by the market. It's established by the investment bankers. They have to help the companies issue their new stock and they determine the price. And then C, in a Dutch auction, so this is very particular, investors who want to buy shares in an IPO submit bids, indicating how many shares they want to buy and the price they are willing to pay. The company determines how many shares it wants to sell. The highest price that enables the company to sell the desired number of shares is the price that all buyers must pay. And that is correct, and that is usually the case. I think the book gave one example that seemed to sound a little different than that, so you won't ever see this question again. Um, so anyways, D, uh, it is important. It is possible that the price set in the IPO is so high that investors will refuse to buy the number of shares that the company wants to sell. In this, and that's true, in this situation the IPO is said to be oversubscribed. The word for that would be undersubscribed. Undersubscribed. Okay. And then E, it is possible the price set in the IPO is so low that investors will want to buy more shares than the company wants to sell. That's true. In that case, the company will have to issue more shares than it wants to sell. That's false. This is, they've already, they issue a predetermined amount. So, predetermined, we'll say number of shares. 
And then let's look at question 13. Which of the statements is not correct? So um, just keep in mind here that we're focusing on finding the thing that's not true. So if we see something's true, we're going let to it, let it go. So A, when a corporation's shares are owned by a few individuals, we say that the firm is closely or privately held. That's true. B, going public establishes a firm's true intrinsic value and ensures that a liquid market will always exist for the firm's share. That's false. There's no guarantee. And then C, the stock of a public, you just know that C, D, and E are all true statements, so be something that you could look over. Um, and then I guess a comment for E is that it's possible for a firm to go public and yet not raise any additional new capital for the firm itself. And the way they could do that is they could give it to a foundation, like as a donation. So I'll say as a donation. And then let's look at 14, 15, and 16 are true false. 14. A publicly owned corporation is a company whose shares are held by the investing public, which may include other corporations as well as institutional investors. That's true. 15. If you decide to buy 100 shares of Google, you would probably do so by calling your broker and asking him or her to execute the trade for you. This would be defined as a secondary market transaction, not a primary market transaction. That's also a true statement. And then 16. The annual rate of return, well, and also a number 15, you could have a Scott Trade account, so don't, most people starting out call their broker, but if you're a finance major, you probably will have some kind of Scott Trade account and you do the trading online, but you can call the broker too. So this is a true statement, but I just wanted to add that, add that extra part. And then 16. The annual rate of return on any given stock can be found as the stock's dividend for the year plus the change in the stock's price during the year divided by its beginning of the year price. So that's saying the return equals the dividend plus the change in the stock price, so less P1 minus P0 divided by the original stock price. And that is correct for that equation. So that's true. So those were just some example practice problems for chapter two.